the June 4th, 2018 special meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council. Uh, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. Will you call the roll, please? Council Member Friedman? Here. Council Member Dominguez? Mayor Potam Rouse? Here. Council Member Hart? Here. Council Member Sneddon? Here. Mayor Muriel? Here. Mr. Casey, do we have public comment um, speaker slips? Uh, items not on the agenda. No, Madam Mayor, but can I make an announcement? Yes, please. <laughs> on a slight change to our agenda. Our city attorney is not feeling well and so he's not here today and so what i would recommend is that we take the city attorney's budget presentation and move that to wednesday night which is your final deliberation at 6 p.m but we can put him up front and then you'll have that information and then hopefully make decisions wednesday night if that's okay with you all that makes good sense madam clerk will you meet our read our item please Item number two, subject fiscal year 2019, recommended operating and capital budget. Okay, so are we starting with the finance department? We are. Yep. Thank, <clears throat> Mr. Thank Samario, you, go thank ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council, Bob Samario, finance director. So today we're covering all the administrative departments. So this is the last of the public hearings before Wednesday where council uh, will be asking council to make final decisions on everything that you've heard to date. Um, so we have administrative departments with the exception of the city attorney's office and we are starting with finance. So I just wanted to mention I have my managers and supervisors here who are sitting generally in the front sort of section. Um, I am very fortunate to have a great you know, staff, managers, supervisors, and everybody else, professional staff. We do a lot with a, with a few, with few resources, and I'm always amazed every year how much we accomplished. Um, but we, know we are here to serve not only the external customers, but internal customers, all the other departments. We are really a sort of the core administrative function or department for the city. And our primary mission is to hand, handle the financial affairs of all the departments and all the enterprise funds and the like, so they don't have to worry about generating their own paychecks and processing their own money and all that. We handle everything for them so they can kind of do the things they do best, like fighting fires and all that. This is an, an overview of the organization chart for the department. You can see in the top left, we have 17 programs. Those are the things you see in the budget, the budgetary programs. We spend three funds, not only the general fund, but the, the solid waste enterprise fund and the risk management or self-insurance fund. Um, we have six divisions. We have budget management um, with Brendan Baudet. He is the newest of our, of our managers. He replaced Michael Pease and he's to my right and he'll be sharing in this presentation. Uh, we have general services um, overseen by Bill Hornung, Julie Nemus oversees treasury, and then under accounting, Jennifer Tomaszewski. Environmental services, Renee Harley, that won't be covered today since she, we did a separate presentation for the solid waste fund. And last but not least, under risk management, we have Mark Howard, and he will be at the tail end of this presentation to cover that fund. And so we don't get a chance to speak to you and tell you about what we do. We're, we're kind of a back office operation, but I did want to highlight some of the things we do do because I think they're very important and sometimes we forget about them. And by, by division, starting with the treasurer division, what we do in there, among other things, is we collect all the money citywide. So if you think of the budget, it's $340, $350 million of money that gets brought in every day or every year, I should say. It all runs through our finance department, our cashier and treasury staff whether it's wire over the counter by mail, um, that we handle all and process all those cash receipts. We also invest the, the city's money. We, at any given point in time, we might have $160 million of funds that are really represented by reserves that we have to invest in accordance with state law and our own policy. Um, and so that's one of the active things that we get involved with and invest in those funds. And then we administer the local um, permit, tax and permit collections in accordance with municipal code, essentially Title V. That could be all, the, all of our tax receipts, but things like massage permits and taxi permits and those things. And then we also send out about 29,000 utility bills. Um, um, we have a certain, to, to about 29,000 accounts, more than that per, per year, but that's how many accounts we have at any given point in time. Some of the metrics that uh, re reflect the treasury division, as I mentioned, our average portfolio is about $165 million. We process about 37,000 payments over the counter in, in our downstairs office. We issue three, about 370,000 utility bills each year. 
We have customers who are on auto pay for those utilities. We have 9,400 right now who are on auto pay, which is great, and we're always looking to add to that list because it makes just everybody's life easier. And then we renew about 13,000 business licenses every year. And this is how the Treasury Division from a budgetary perspective looks. Uh, again, we have Treasury Division Manager Julie Nemus. We have revenue and cash management, utility and miscellaneous billing, license and permits, and, and cash earning collection. This is the largest division within the finance department. In the accounting division, um, they maintain the financial accounting system. So we have a system that's citywide. Every department is, is, is part of that and uses the system to track all of our revenues and expenditures and those kinds of things. We also prepare all the city, state, and federal reports, mostly at year end, but we also do some interim reporting. So we report to you every month our, how we're doing from a budget perspective. Um, on, a more, on a quarterly basis, we do a more compre comprehensive report. We process payroll for all of our city employees. We consider that to be an important thing we do, and we make sure that they're accurate and people feel very strongly about their paychecks. So we, we try really hard to make sure that they're correct, and they are. And then we just select like the money coming in, all the money that goes out in this, in this uh, city, the 300 and so million dollars per year, it gets processed by our staff, mostly AP staff, to pay the bills for on behalf of all departments. So it's a, it's a lot of work we do with few people. And you can see on the top right, we have 9.13 FTEs for, in this division, but only about three people handle payroll and accounts payable for the entire city. So it's a, we do a lot with few people, as I said. Some of the sample metrics that we have in the accounting division, we issue about 2,100 W-2s each year in January. All comes due at one time or one month. We process about 39,000 paychecks every year. And this is just one of the things we track, how many employees we have per payroll staff. So for, for every 700 employees, we have one payroll staff. So you can see that we have less than two, essentially, per, per employee for all citywide employees. Um, we process invoices, about 42,000 per year. So just give you a sense of the magnitude of what we do. And this is how it looks programmatically, the three programs, accounting services, payroll, and accounts payable. The general services division, people think of them as purchasing, but they do more than that. But uh, one of the primary things they do do is ensure that we purchase things in accordance with our purchasing code. We have a very strict code. It dictates how we go about buying things. And it really comes down to encouraging competition and avoiding conflicts of interest. You know, 100 years ago, this was a big issue in, in government, uh, cronyism and conflicts of interest. And we've come a long way since then, and our purchasing code reflects that we make sure that, that when we buy things, that we are getting the best price because we advertise these things for the, in general, and that we're ensuring that there isn't any conflict of interest. We also maintain a, a warehouse of some specialized inventory. These are things that we can buy in bulk, rags and, and things like that, but we also carry things that have a lo long lead time, like meters, so it takes months to get them, and so we make sure we have them on stock. And then we also uh, sort and deliver all the inner office and U.S. Postal Service mail for throughout the city. We issue about 2,300 purchase orders each year. We process about 250 contracts each year. We fill 2,800 uh, requisition orders in the warehouse. And then we also um, process about 115,000 pieces of ongoing um, mail each year. And this is how it looks from a programmatic perspective three programs and last but not least administration division uh, we provide um, and this includes budget management by the way you'll see but we provide administrative support to all to my finance managers um, as, and then guidance and support to all the departments we also manage the issuance of debt so any any department or fund that wants to issue debt for whatever purpose primarily capital um, we take the lead in that or assist with that and of course, we then manage the development of the annual budget. And that's where Brandon comes into play. So here are the, the two programs, administration and budget management. Some programmatic highlights. Uh, so we are working, and you'll hear this later, we're working with information technology to upgrade uh, our what we call our Munis financial management system. Again, it's a citywide system. We implemented that uh, several years ago, and it was a, a great, at great length and time and pain to get that new system in, uh, implemented. But every few years, we have to upgrade that to the latest versions um, because the, the, the company only supports certain versions. So that's, uh, we're in the middle of that, and it's, uh, it's a fair amount of work. We're working with IT on that. 
And then one of the things that, that I'll be doing this year in, in light of the passage of Measure C is to create a, an annual accountability report. This is something we committed to doing. And so we're working on creating a template for that so that when we have our first oversight committee meeting in, in the fall, we'll have that ready to go and to put, provide not only to them but also to the public. And then we're working, we're in the middle of an RFP and we plan to implement a new banking contract by the end of next year. And that's going to be a big, uh, you know, big workload for us if, in fact, we end up changing banks versus ret retaining the existing bank. And then something, unfortunately, we have to do every 10 years or so is to update our, and to take a, an inventory of all our fixed assets. These are things like um, buildings, equipment, and the like. And, it's a, and our auditors have been suggesting we do this for a while now, so it's, I think it's time for us to do that. And you'll see that in the numbers that Mr. Baudet uh, talks about. And then we're also looking to prepare and issue an RP for e-signature software. This is, you know, the latest wave where we're doing a lot of electronic signatures. So things like contracts and the like where we're having to mail things and send them for a signature, we can do this um, online, kind of like what the real estate industry does now. Everything is electronic these days. So that's, we're, we're looking at that option. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. Again, Brandon is new, but he's been great. He came from Public Works. We really like having him, and um, he's going to go over the numbers for us. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, I'm just going to go over a brief financial overview of two sections of the general fund today, uh, one being the finance department, the other being uh, what we refer to as general government uh, type sections. So this is a uh, pie chart of um, uh, distribution of by major object. Um, as you can see, the majority of funds are dedicated to uh, our people, so our, our salary and benefits. Um, we have about 47 and a half full-time employees that are come out of this. By now, you should be somewhat familiar with this table. Um, basically, it's kind of showing how uh, we're projecting the end of fiscal year uh, in our expenditures, uh, what was originally proposed in the two-year financial plan, what is being recommended as part of the FY19 budget, and the differences in between. Uh, overall, we had very minor changes to our to our plan. Uh, we had some incremental changes to our salary and benefits. Uh, in our supplies and services, there was um, some contracts that went up in, in addition to the citywide fixed asset inventory that Mr. Samario mentioned previously. Uh, moving on to revenues, uh, we made some slight adjustments to better uh, reflect current trends in the late penalties and uh, tourism business improvement district admin fee. Um, in addition, on the other category, uh, you'll see a slight increase there. That's actually the other portion from the non-general fund city departments paying for the citywide fixed asset inventory. So that's their portion paying for it. If there's any questions, I'll move on to the general government. I don't see any lights. Thank you. So the general government category, it, this is uh, not attached to any specific program within the general fund. Um, it, basically, it's a, where most transfers take place, where we keep our appropriated reserves. Uh, the capital transfers, that actually, this line item doesn't exactly reflect your budget document on page B20. Uh, that's because um, last October, council directed that uh, the surplus from general fund uh, be directed, dedicated to the capital fund expenditures. So this is just presented what's actually um, was part of the, general, the original plan. Uh, we've added the Measure C transfer for the Measure C capital projects. And the last three items are transfers out to the Downtown Parking Fund uh, for the Downtown Ambassador Program, the State Street Maintenance Contract, and the New Beginnings RV Overnight Program. And with that, I'll take any questions. Good job. We don't have any questions. Thanks. Oh, Mr. Dominguez, there you go. <laughs> And that's it for the finance department? Or we have the self-insurance fund. Okay. The question I was going to ask, there were some recent news articles about uh, an embezzlement that took place at the county, a couple million dollars. What, uh, what fixtures do you have in place to prevent that from happening here? Madam Mayor, Councilmember Dominguez, that's a good question. So when that when we heard about that, we, um, we wanted to see, do we have any of those such sort of um, types of one-time invoices or pay, payees? We hired our auditors to, to do a special study to look at that because we apparently have some of those one-time vendor payments uh, in, their, in our organization. 
and they looked at the internal controls, what procedures are in place, are there approvals in place, and those kinds of things, and they came up with no recommended changes. They thought we had enough internal controls to prevent that kind of thing from happening. Uh, clearly, the county situation was very unique because the, the individual or an individual, uh, the accountant at the time, um, was somehow able to get access to the password and, ac and security codes for the for her supervisor to be able to approve these things, not only create, but, but approve them. Um, that doesn't exist here, and the, and the auditors found that we had good, good enough internal controls that um, it wasn't a concern at our end. And, and there was another issue with a vendor that was being used where one of the employees had an ownership stake. Do we have a policy regarding that? Yeah, it's the same thing. We're talking about um, an individual being able to create a one-time vendor, and whether that vendor is a, a real vendor or, or some vendor that they've created, we have, again, procedures in place that prevent that because there is um, approval requirements. We also have the ability, and we do run reports that, that identify when a one-time vendor is being created and we see some unusual patterns. We in the finance department, not just what they're doing out in departments, we look at those to make sure that if there's any unusual pattern, we can investigate those. Great, thank you. Mr. Friedman. Thanks, I had a, a question. It actually uh, came from page D41, and it was about um, about our inventory of stock purchases and purchasing. Do we have a, a local vendor outreach program similar to what the county does in terms of just everyday purchases for office supplies where we're able to bid contract, when we've got to bid contracts for those, that local uh, vendors that have a, uh, have, we can give them a 6% preference is what the county does so that we can support local businesses rather than out of the area? Yeah. You know, um Council Member Freeman, we do not have anything in our ordinance that provides any kind of preference to local businesses. Everything we bid is bid competitively. It's open to anybody to bid. Um, those kind of smaller purchases, we did tend to go to local businesses. However, um, bigger bigger purchases, and particularly with any kind of public works contract, you know, it, it depends. Um, but we don't have anything in our ordinance that provides any kind of local preference. So if we if we wanted to at some point we could we could explore that type of an option and this is more for everyday for purchases for office supplies and those types of things um, that in bulk I mean at the city we they, there's a lot of that's invested in it from day to day year to year so sure. it'd be something maybe in the future I'd like to talk with you about just how we could support our local businesses especially when they're uh, competitively bidding and if they can get an extra couple right. percent what's interesting is about the supplies the smaller supplies typically come from like the, the larger chains like Staples and the like so. You know, defining local business might be a little interesting, but yeah, I'd be happy to have that conversation. Thanks, Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Bodet, uh, back on slide 22, uh, State Street maintenance number is that a does that represent that doesn't represent the entire contract? Is that about half of what the actual um, amount is? And is it expressed that way because this is not which department are we not representing, Madam Mayor, Councilman Rouse? That is 50% of the budget of the overall budget is so it's 50 percent from the general fund that's reflected here the other 50 percent is funded by downtown parking that comes out of there okay but so that's considered with the enterprise funds okay thank you okay mr dominguez your light is still on you're good anybody else oh miss nitton it's just a quick one about utility bills issued annually on d36 and they're projected They were, they went down, and then they're projected to go up. And I'm just, I'm just curious about that. It goes from 375, 365 sure. to 370. Is that tied to population in the city, or, or so what I'm is that number? I'm going to have, I think, our treasury manager, Ms. Demas, come up and respond to that question. Or, what page are you on, Ms. Austin? D36. It's not an important point. I was just oh, curious. Well, well, yeah. Give it a shot. Julie Nemus, Treasury Manager. Um, so we that number does vary year to year. It really just depends on how many uh, accounts are open, people moving in and out. So it can vary by five or ten thousand. Um, we generally see it around three hundred and seventy-five thousand. It came in. We're projecting it's coming in a little bit lower this year. Um, might just be because there's uh, not as many transfers in and out. Um, so when there's more movement going in and out of accounts, we have to issue more bills. There's more final bills. There's more new bills. So we're just projecting it might bounce back up a little bit next year. Okay, so it's not an indication of the number of people leaving and coming. It's just 
changing of locations within. That's correct. Okay. It's just movement in and out of the accounts. Thank you. And before Ms. Nemus leaves, I just want to let you all know that Ms. Nemus is going to be uh, leaving the city on June 12th. She is uh, moving to LA and she will be working essentially the same position, but for the city of West Hollywood. And so um, we're really going to be sorry to see her leave. She's been an amazing asset for the last four or five years. Um, so anyway, I want to just give her that recognition in front of all of you. Thanks, Ms. Nemus, for working with us and congratulations. It's Okay, so self-insurance fund. Yep, and um, uh, Mark Howard, our risk manager, will be um, making that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Baudet. Good afternoon, Madam Hello. Mayor, members of council. Mark Howard, the risk manager, or the person who administers your self-insurance fund. Over the next few minutes, I'll be walking through this presentation about both revenues and appropriations, and I welcome your questions and comments as the presentation unfolds. So today I'll be talking about these four main points, the overview of the, the three main programs within the, the self-insurance fund, appropriations and revenues, a uh, review of our balance, reserve balance, and then the key performance objectives. And so here's a look at the risk management division organizational chart. Three main programs are general liability, workers' compensation, and occupational safety and health. Uh, so brief description of what each program does. The workers' compensation program provides benefits to injured employees in compliance with state and federal law and help employees return back to work following an injury. The liability program investigates incidents on city property and just damage claims and also uh, coordinates correction of hazards on our public property. And then our Occupational Safety and Health Program ensures a safe work environment for all city employees through training, medical screening, and safety analysis, and provides training under the monthly Injury and Illness Prevention Program. And so we move into a summary of our proposed budget. We'll start off with the estimated revenues. The self-insurance fund generates revenues by charging each of the operating departments and programs a premium for their exposures and it falls into three main categories workers compensation general liability and property insurance uh, some of the smaller items the uninsured unemployment insurance and occupational safety and health charges uh, these revenues will we estimate to be just over eight million dollars for fiscal year 19 uh, not much change from the original plan or projections, uh, but there is one uh, large number that jumps out there, and that's on the interest income. And you probably heard this several times that our portfolio is doing much better than it has in past years. And as far as appropriations go, we are looking at most of our appropriations fall under the two categories of either claims or insurance premiums. Uh, that comprises about 80% of all appropriations within the, the fund. Uh, you'll notice that unlike the previous presentation where salaries and benefits took up the vast majority of appropriations, here we have reversed that. And we, salaries and benefits makes up only 8% of the, of the operating budget here. Uh, but that operating budget does have a slight change for fiscal 19. We have in the past chosen to underfill the liability analyst position as a part-time position in previous fiscal years. We're planning on moving that back to a full-time position. Since it was underfunded by choice, we're not asking for additional revenue because that's already factored into this uh, piece here for salaries and benefits. Uh, but you'll notice that the the vast majority of the appropriations, as stated before, belong with the different insurance claims and insurance pieces. Uh, we are self-insured for the first $750,000 for workers' compensation or a million dollars for uh, general liability. So we do purchase insurance for what we call excess insurance for those operations so that we can minimize any shock loss that might come from one specific incident or episode. Uh, what we're seeing is that the renewal uh, 
quotes for fiscal 19 are showing steep increases for most of these insurance policies. Uh, that's projected here on the presentation. We're not unique in California. All public entities are seeing this uh, over the last several years. The trend for uh, claims and costs have been increasing across the state, and we're all subject to that same uh, industry look. On the good side, you'll notice that the unemployment compensation has been trending lower for the past couple of years, uh, so we are seeing good news in that in that area. So this is the, the slide that often creates some confusion, so I'm going to go through it rather slowly. Uh, we have a biannual actuarial report. We hire an outside firm to tell us how much money the self-insurance fund needs to operate to pay for it. existing claims today, existing claims tomorrow, and what they called incurred but not reported claims, or IBNR. And so in fiscal year 16, the actuary recommended that we had $11.8 million of funds available to pay for claims in 16 and those costs that might fall over into future fiscal years, plus those incurred but not reported claims. We had available $6.5 million, which shows up as a $5.3 million difference. That difference is what we report on our CAFA report as an underfunded liability. So as you can see from fiscal year 16 through fiscal year 17, we improved our bottom line stance in that area. We went from being short $5.3 million to now short $3.7 million. So we're moving in the correct direction to become fully funded within the self-insurance fund. We're not there yet. We probably won't make it there in fiscal 18 nor in fiscal 19, but we went we are making up the, the shortfall as we go along. This is the result of the peaks and valleys within the insurance industry. You've probably seen this yourself when you're buying different insurance policies. Some years it's more expensive than others. And then you tack on top of that the, the difference in the claim volatility that happens in any given fiscal year. And we will see these peaks and valleys. We've been through a trend of a few times through this actual process where those uh, numbers seem to be pointing back towards those peaks. Hopefully we'll get back to a, a valley trend sooner rather than later. And now looking at our P3 performance and work objectives, for fiscal 19, the risk management division overhauled and revised all of the performance measures. Uh, we're now, you'll see more measuring of results for key components tracking items that actually influence the results and removing those items that are just tracking workflow. So for example, in the workers' compensation, we hire a third-party administrator or TPA to perform the day-to-day -day operations, the mailing of checks, the scheduling of medical examinations, those kind of things. So we are now going to track how long it takes us to report a new claim to the third-party administrator because we know faster reporting of claims makes it less costly, so we're going to be tracking that to make sure that we're, we're within five days. We want to keep the lost time, the, those injuries that require people to miss time from work to be 50% or less of the entire makeup of the uh, number of claims reported. In the liability program, we want to relay those reports of a hazard that we can correct or fix within seven days to the department that actually does that, that operation. And we want to maintain our claim payments within the established budgetary parameters that you've given us. And then on occupational safety and health, tracking the number of injury, industrial injury claims reported each fiscal year. And then for the admin operations, which is where we track the, the insurance policies that we buy for excess and specialty operations, complete those renewals within the budgetary constraints. That will be challenging in fiscal 19 as I'm starting to see the renewal quotes come in at much higher than we anticipated. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Uh, Mr. Rouse. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Matter. Um, Mr. Howard, does the, uh, do each of the job classifications carry, the, I mean, how do you develop experience modifications? Or do you do this in the public sector as well? And if so, do you use like a state standard for a job classification? How does that work? Uh, 
Madam Mayor, Councilman Rouse, we don't do an exact experience modification in a self-insured setting. We have something similar and we do track that through our actuarial report. They, they match what our actual results are to what the statewide uh, results are. And many of our uh, job classifications track similarly to the, the outside structure. Some are a little bit higher. I was just kind of curious, just in case there was a certain job classification or type that was particularly hazardous, had a lot of incidents, and you thought, well, do we keep this as a public sector or do we do we contract this out, that type of thing, the kind of decisions that could be made if it affected our overall uh, performance as a, as a fund? That would be nice to do, but the ones that we see that have the highest experience modification are not the ones that we're going to be able to, to farm out to the general public they fall into those areas of public safety okay you got that one um and then lastly uh, does the actuarial shortfall that you shows up as on the lies of liability does that affect our bond rating as a city i will defer that no. the answers no peanuts okay yeah. thank you thanks mr rouse uh, council member snedden thank you just a clarifying question on that last slide 41 is that the occupational safety and health? Is that 1,463 claims? Mayor Murillo and Council And how does Snyder. that match up with D43 that says, say, 200 new claims? And how do we compare to other cities? That Excellent question. The, the 1463 is just the program number for occupational safety and health. <laughs> no, that's just the program number. Good, thanks. Uh, Mr. Dominguez. I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Howard, for your great work. I appreciate the, the number of measures that you've met successfully and the fact that you're adding in new measures is always great. And um, you're in kind of an interfacing department. You're not out with the public, so you don't get praise from the public. So I'll just take this moment to thank you for your great work. Thank you for keeping uh, a seat empty that you didn't feel you needed for a while to help our, our expenditures. So thank you. Very good. Thanks for your report. So that's it for the finance department, Mr. Samario. Thank you. Good work. And it looks like we're going to administrative services, Mr. Casey. And, um, Ms. Schmidt, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Mayor, City Council members. I'm Christy Schmidt. I'm the Director of Administrative Services. And we have an abbreviated budget presentation today since we're in the second year of a two-year uh, financial plan. Um, we're going to focus today uh, not too much on what we do. Um, we're going to really focus on the differences in our budget from what we had proposed last year um, and some of the key initiatives that we have. And we have uh, two of our staff members, our managers, here to make the presentation. I've got Sarah Gorman, City Clerk Services Manager, and Marianne Knight here. We'll do, Sarah will do the uh, general fund portions of our budget, and then we have the Information Systems Fund, uh, and Marianne will take over for that. Uh, okay. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. This is Sarah Gorman, City Clerk Services Manager. So I'm gonna start with a brief overview of the department, including all of the funds, then we'll look at each fund individually, starting with the general fund, followed by the ICS funds, or intercity service funds for information technology. As you can see, the administrative services Div department consists of three major, major divisions, the city clerk, human resources, and information technology, in addition to administration, Department Director Christy Schmidt oversees the administration program, which includes labor relations. I oversee the city clerk functions. Human resources is managed by Susie Gonzalez. Susie sadly has announced her upcoming retirement after 31 years of service to the city. And Marianne Knight is our IT manager. The department consists of eight programs. The two city clerk programs are operations and elections. The two human resources programs are operations and training, and the three information technology programs are network and infrastructure, enterprise applications, and geographic information systems. And the administration program includes labor relations. 
department has 31.6 assigned full-time employee um, positions. Okay, looking at the total budget by fund. The total administrative services department budget is over 6.5 million. Information technology operations and capital account for approximately 57% of the budget at 3.7 million. These costs are budgeted in an intercity services fund and funded through service charges to the city various departments. The general fund portion of the administrative services department covers administration and labor relations, human resources, and the city clerk's office. And these operations are funded through overhead charges to departments. Okay, looking at general fund operations. In fiscal year 2019, we'll have a net increase in expenditures of 195,000, primarily due to negotiated salary increases and the addition of a special election November 2018 to decide various charter measures. The primary adjustments for supplies and services are for the election. Looking at our staffing and our program changes, um, we do have a reclassified administrative specialist in HR to an accounting assistant for th um, 6,396. Um, expected cost for a November 2018 election of 180,000. Um, uh, the clerk's office did see an increase in the number of appeals filed with our office in fiscal year um, 18 versus the previous year. 11 appeals were filed in fiscal year 17, whereas 18 were filed the next year. We do seem to be seeing an, an e increase in those. Okay, looking at key initiatives and objectives. Key initiatives and objectives in 2018 will include labor negotiations with at least three of our eight bargaining units, including both police and fire. The city clerk's office will be focusing on the 2018 special election and then shifting focus to improving record keeping systems for electronic records. The electronic records project addresses the expansion of records maintained in electronic form and includes work to ensure those records are retained in a modern and efficient fashion and will include research regarding better ways to create, manage, and store those records. Human resources, in turn, will continue to enhance and expand core supervisory training programs and will be a big player in the implementation of a time and attendance software to automate employee time card entry and attendance management. Now I will pass this off to Mary Ann Knight, Information Technology Manager, to discuss the budget for IT. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Mary Ann Knight, and I am the City's Information Technology Manager, and I'm honored to speak to you today about the IT budget for fiscal year 2019. As Ms. Gorman uh, previously stated, the Information Technology Budget consists of an operating budget and a capital budget from which we fund projects such as our annual network and computer replacement program, system upgrades, and new system implementations. We are requesting a lower capital budget than originally planned in FY19 due to the postponement of an upgrade to the utility billing system, which has been rescheduled to fiscal year 2020. Our operating budget includes an increase in salary and benefits due to the conversion of a part-time hourly position to a regular full-time position in fiscal year 18. This increase was funded by an offset in hourly salaries and a reduction in other expenditures, some of which are shown here on this slide. We have a $30,000 increase in internet service charges under the city's new franchise agreement with Cox Communications. These services were free to the city under the prior agreement. Revenues for the IT funds come from service charges to departments, which remain as planned for fiscal year 2019. So to recap, our significant changes are the addition of a web services technician position in fiscal year 18 and the postponement of the utility billing system upgrade until 2020. Um, I would like to highlight a few of our key projects from this year. Um, IT implemented a new work order system for our user support services, also known as the help desk. The new system is linked to the help desk email and voicemail accounts so that um, messages left in either location are automatically logged as service requests and assigned to a technician. 
um, and this has resulted in over 4,200 support incidents resolved so far this year. We have a project to redesign the data center at Fire Station 1 uh, to make it the city's primary data center, and this project is underway. We're expecting our initial design plan this week. We have contracted with a um, vendor for remote infrastructure as a service, which will allow us to um, resume access to critical city systems in the event that any of the city, uh, our own city data centers are destroyed in a disaster. <clears throat> and lastly, our staff is meeting um, with the departments to review their GIS needs so that we can build a comprehensive GIS work plan going forward. In fiscal year 19, our focus is on project management as our staff are engaged in project work more than ever before. This includes the implementation of a new system for the management of individual projects and for tracking staff workload overall. Another objective of ours is to complete a needs assessment for a constituent relationship management system to see if this is something the city is ready to implement. And with that, I will turn it back over to Ms. Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you. If, if there are any questions, uh, Ms. Gorman's here, Susan Gonzalez, our HR manager, is here, and Ms. Knight is also available for questions. Uh, Mr. Friedman. Um, I, I did have a question on uh, page uh, D3. I had a couple. One, I was, um, as a new performance measure that you're implementing, um, it's uh, staff hours spent responding to Public Records Act requests. I think that's positive in light of um, the discussion we had at the the council the other night on the amount of time it actually takes for all the departments to review it. So I'm uh, pleased that you're keeping track of it. And then um, I did have a question. I saw that on campaign statements processed for fiscal year 18, it was 50 was expected. And then the number projected is 350. And then uh, the proposed is 100. Was such a, can you speak to those numbers on why there's such a discrepancy on those? Are you referencing one of the pages in our booklet? Yeah, it's on page D3. D3? Yeah. Yes, as it, as it was, we ended up getting a lot more um, campaign statements than we had been expecting because um, of the number of um, uh, well-funded candidates in the, in the election. We expect to continue receiving um, a good number of candidate statements going forward. And additionally, there was a, a change in campaign finance law that requires that expenditures or contributions of $1,000 or more need to be repeated, reported within 24 hours. That law used to only apply 30 days before the election. It's now 90 days before the election. So um, we're now exact, essentially expecting more um, campaign statements than we used to. Okay. Oh, sorry, Mr. Dominguez. Regarding the amount for the 2018 election, it's, uh, was it 198 or where? Uh, it's 180,000 for the election. There's some other things in there. And this is just for a charter amendment ballot measure? Correct, Madam Mayor and Council Member Dominguez, yes. This is for the uh, two proposed charter amendments and education and outreach for it. Okay. If anything else were added, would that significantly change that amount, or is it incremental at that point? Madam Mayor and Councilmember Dominguez, I'd say it would be moderately incremental. The One of the reasons that that is a big number is because this is uh, the measures would apply to the whole city. So if we're, once we're doing an election for the whole city, if we're adding on more, it might not be that much that much more. And what would be the budget if we put that ballot measure on next year's November election? How much would that change what we'd already be expecting from the three district elections? Uh, yeah. Ma Madam Mayor and Council Member Dominguez, it would, it would still be a reasonably high added cost if we were to add it on to the November 19 election because as it, as it stands now, the November 19 election is only for three districts or half the city. There isn't another citywide measure on. There isn't a, a mayoral election on. So once you're adding on those three more districts, that's a, that's a good chunk more cost. Do you know what that would be, that increment? 
Ballpark? I'm ball, ballpark uh, 75,000, but that's very, very ballpark. So there would be a significant savings if this were to be moved over 100,000? Yeah, yes, I did say yes. Okay, thank you. Very good. Okay, I don't see any other lights. Um, I did want to ask about the constituent relationship management system. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Um, Madam Mayor, um, yes, a constituent uh, relationship management system is something um, that's been used in the private industry for a very long time, a product such as Salesforce and other um, ways of managing contact information. Um, it's used in the public arena. Um, you often may have heard of 311 systems, uh, so they can be associated with phone systems. We are looking at possibly just something where it would be an online platform for the public to interact with the city and um, for the city to track all of those interactions. So we do have methods now for people to report things such as outages um, or requests for services, but we don't have a back end right now to manage all of those requests. Okay, very good. Anything else? Ms. Gonzalez, should we say goodbye to you now? What, how much longer do you have? We'll bring Four her back. Months. She's here till October, so okay. she's, she's not going anywhere real soon. We have time Thank to you. celebrate. Okay. Thank you, then, uh, Ms. Schmidt and your staff. And City Administrator's Office is next. Whenever you're ready, Ms. Johnson. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Nina Johnson. I'm the Senior Assistant to the City Administrator, and this afternoon I'd be presenting the proposed budget for the City Administrator's Office and Mayor and Council's Office. Through this presentation, uh, I'll be covering our revenues and expenditures, our work plan for the upcoming year, and this year we, we don't have any proposed budget adjustments, so we're really looking uh, at a status quo budget as a second year uh, of our two-year financial plan. In the city administrator's office, we have a total of 8.3 full-time equivalent positions plus three hourly employees in city TV. This is an organizational chart that really gives a better sense of uh, how we organize our office and how we're managing all 10 departments plus the citywide program areas of sustainability, legislation, communication, business relations, um, all of that handled uh, through the city administrator's office. To review um, our expenditures, we have a total budget proposed of 2.5, just over 2.5 million. 69% of that budget is for salaries and benefits. 17% goes towards supplies and services, and a lot of that uh, amount is for allocated costs, which are uh, citywide expenses that are shared by all departments and allocated to each department, so our share of the cost is, is in there. So for example, that would be facilities, telephones, custodial services, and so forth. Plus our professional uh, agreements, um, we have a, a contribution for the South Coast Task Force on Youth Safety of 67,000, that amount is also in there. We also have uh, almost 360, it shows 360 in special project costs, but 200,000 of that is actually now going towards, it's for the strategic energy plan development and that is actually going to be moved to the Public Works Department. So, uh, that amount will be 200000 less uh, in the approved budget. So you can see that amount dropping. Uh, the remainder of, of that special project amount is for city TV capital projects and also for some sustainability uh, dues and project efforts uh, that's budgeted each year. So just to turn to our performance objectives and what we're going to be accomplishing, uh, we're going to be issuing, continuing the issuance of the weekly electronic city news and brief. 
and also our quarterly business newsletter. The City News in Brief goes out to 18,000 subscribers, uh, a very large uh, list of people getting news about every department and news events, project updates. Uh, a lot of our, our communication energy uh, is focused on making sure we get out good updates there. The State of the City presentation each spring, we put that together for, on behalf of the mayor and the city administrator. With the passage of Measure C, we're looking at uh, implementing, the help working with Public Works and the Finance Department to implement the spending plan, uh, the, the citizens convening, the citizens oversight committee meetings, and the other transparency measures, annual reporting, the website, uh, making sure the public has information to see that funds are being spent as approved by the voters. Also, an, another work effort, coordinating the evaluation and issuance of commercial cannabis business licenses pursuant to council direction. This is something that Matt Four is working on with the police department. And then working with our city staff and the sustainability council committee to develop indicators and a dashboard to describe the city's sustainability condition and our progress in that regard. In City TV, we're looking at for our uh, capital projects, replacing this uh, projector here and integrating it into the audiovisual system. Will also be a major project uh, in City TV is replacing the video editing system with new technology. So that's so hardware and software. To pay for those projects in City TV, those are paid for with PEG fee revenues. PEG fee stands for Public Education and Governmental Access. Uh, that's a fee that is charged on all the cable, bill, cable bills, 1%. That's divided evenly between the capital uh, program for our city TV and also for TV Santa Barbara, our community access channel. And I'm gonna cover that a little bit later. Now moving to the mayor and council's office. Uh, we have, uh, on the screen, we've got eight full-time equivalent positions. Uh, all of uh, the mayor and council members, and then one executive assistant. And that's in two programs. So the positions, uh, your positions are shown in the salaries and benefits in the blue part of the, uh, the blue part of the pie. That's just over 600,000. In special projects, the very small amount, that 1,500 is going towards sister cities and their dues. We, uh, we cover that in the mayor and council's office. And then also the supplies and services, which are again, the allocated costs, those shared citywide expenses, plus meeting and travel. All, and then the final, the largest piece, goes towards our arts and community promotions funding, all for a total of uh, over 3.4 million. I'm gonna spend some time talking about um, that larger piece of the pie. What we've decided to do in taking a closer look at the funding is uh, rename this program. And just to give you a little bit of background, three years ago, what we decided to do was consolidate all of the different pots of money for arts and events and festivals, uh, Visit Santa Barbara, then the Conference and Visitors Bureau. We decided to consolidate all of that spending in one program under the Mayor and Council's office. And with the former uh, program heading of Arts and Community Promotion. But in really looking at what we're paying for in that program, uh, the historic arts festivals, uh, the visitor center, we're paying the chamber, uh, econo economic forecast project, what we've really decided to do is rename it and consolidate those work activities to improve economic vibrancy because all of those efforts are bringing people to Santa Barbara, uh, bringing residents uh, into our commercial areas where basically funding the experiences to get people out, uh, th that vibrancy, uh, that's where we're consolidating all of that effort. So we want to unify uh, the city's investment in all of those activities in this one program area. So we're renaming it Arts and Economic Vitality. Uh, there's no change in funding in the program. Uh, while I continue to oversee the funding, I administer the agreements and establish the work plan. None of my staff time is there. So we haven't made any changes to the costs in that program. There are no staff costs. So for a total, uh, we spend, we're proposing a total of 2.6 million next year. 
uh, that's maintaining our contribution to Visit Santa Barbara at uh, 1,038,000 for marketing and promotion services, enhancing tourism. We're keeping our contribution to the Santa Barbara County of Office and Arts and Culture uh, the same, 151,000 for arts coordination. And I'm gonna come to that in a moment. And then also we're keeping our funding the same for grants to outside arts organizations. So there's no change in funding in the program. By way of background, I wanted to include a slide on, that helps explain our partnership with the Office of, uh, County Office of Arts and Culture. And I apologize for the graphic because it still uses their previous name, uh, the County Arts Commission, but that can kind of help us uh, because this chart really shows that we pay for half of their staff time. Uh, they devote between two and a half full-time equivalent positions. Uh, half of their time goes towards uh, service, serving the entire county, and then they also work with the city in staffing our own arts advisory uh, committee and city-specific activities. So we basically have half of their staff time we, con we prepare an annual agreement with them each year uh, and basically outline their services and their work plan each year. I'm working on that with them right now. So the responsibilities that they have are planning the monthly agendas and administering the meetings of the City Arts Advisory Committee, our Visual Art and Public Places Subcommittee, Community Events and Festivals Committee, and they work with those committees to disperse grant funding to about 60 arts organizations, and that's ranging from uh, contributions from a few thousand to maybe 15,000 for various community arts uh, purposes. They also work on a number of special projects, including administering the Poet Laureate Program, for example. They provide a lot of the technical support to artists and art organizations, and just work on convening a number of different arts and cultural arts uh, conversations. They also regularly apply for funding. They, they serve as a regional arts agency and apply for funding through the California Arts Council and Americans for the Arts. So just in summary, um, I wanted to uh, break down the total funding for this overall program. I mentioned the County Office of Arts and Culture staff uh, our funding contribution for their staff time the, by contract is 151000 They oversee the grants, the disbursement of grant dollars to the arts organizations through a few different grant programs. That's 323000 Those are smaller grants to 60-some organizations. We also have the, the rest of the line items here are managed in our office. So the funding for TV Santa Barbara the capital and operations funding that's combined in there. It's about um, 150 for capital and the remainder for operations. That's covered there. The contract with Visit Santa Barbara for 1.3, almost 1.4. And then the community promotion agreements. We manage also here. That's uh, the listing on the far right. These are our historic uh, arts festivals that council uh, regularly revisits for the film festival, Old Spanish Days Fiesta, Summer Solstice, the 4th of July Parade, and then uh, our contribution to the chamber, of the, uh, the chamber for the operation of the visitor center. We also have dues and other special projects for the Economic Forecast Project, the League of California Cities, and also a reimbursement to businesses that provide restrooms, their private restroom for public use downtown all for a total of 2.6 million. So now turning to the performance objectives because we have made uh, a number of changes there. Since our structure, our bylaws and committee structures for the arts funding, they are decades old. Uh, we are proposing to restructure our funding and our committees uh, for arts and community promotion activities. I've had a number of conversations with Sarah York Rubin and talked to our arts advisory committee. We, have a, uh, we wanna make sure we uh, improve the efficiency of our committees. Uh, we have a lot of committees and we wanna make sure uh, we make the best use of staff time and our committee members time and it's really focused uh, work effort and also looking at how uh, we disperse our grant funding. We might want to structure it in a different way. So what we want to do is come back to council with recommendations on how we update the bylaws and the focus of each group. 
uh, because right now we have three groups and that all takes uh, quite a bit of t uh, management and staff time. We're also gonna be continuing uh, through uh, Sarah York Rubin, the pr producing the City Hall Gallery exhibition and also the gallery space at the airport. This year, we started up again right now our rotating exhibits of sculptures on State Street. So we're gonna make sure that we have a few exhibits uh, keeping those sculpture pads um, uh, act actively, uh, making sure we're curating those twice a year. We're gonna organize the annual symposium on the arts. So looking at larger community arts issues, opportunities and challenges. This is a great time for different arts organizations each year to come together and look at uh, the current priorities for the year. A new work effort this year for Sarah's group is putting together a cultural arts master plan uh, that would guide art decisions in relation to city projects and public areas. Uh, they've been participating in the regional effort, the Creative Communities uh, Project. Uh, that planning effort has been going on for uh, a, a year or two. And now we are looking at a priority that we've had at the city for a while, the city's own cultural arts master plan um, and this will cover everything from arts education, support for local artists, um, and of course, uh, our guidelines for how we require and allow art in public areas. So we need more guidance and direction uh, along those lines. Also in our office, we ensure lease compliance for the community arts workshop and MOXIE. Those are city properties. Uh, right now, we're almost wrapping up our long-term lease with the community arts workshop. And then another uh, key project is initiating the redesign of the State Street underpass with art, lighting, sound, and a new traffic reconfiguration. Uh, as council is aware, we have submitted a grant to Caltrans for ATP funding for a new configuration for traffic flow. Uh, so we're hopeful on that effort. We conducted a workshop in November uh, with a few hundred people who attended and gave ideas. Using all of that input, we're repackaging uh, that concept, and we're going to be coming back to council with a full update. We're making, we've had several conversations, many conversations with different arts organizations because there's a lot of interest in how to participate in the project, and uh, we want to make something happen there. We need everybody's support, uh, so we're going to make sure uh, we organize all of that and come back to council uh, with that. A large part of this is looking at the funds, uh, looking at outside funding sources to make this project happen. Uh, so we are starting to apply for grant funding and looking at various community sources for funding this project. Um, looking at the former Macy's building, uh, as you know, we're working with Pacific Retail Partners. Uh, they have acquired the remaining leasehold interest in the uh, former Macy's building, so we're uh, working with them to ensure a high quality development in that space. And then overall, we are, this is a, many projects here represented, but we are working on implementing plans and projects to improve uh, the vibrancy of downtown and other commercial corridors, helping uh, businesses recover from the recent incidents. Uh, this involves projects related to business retention, vacancies, uh, helping uh, with business improvement districts and the formation of a new property improvement district, public safety presence on State Street, planning and permitting, plaza maintenance, uh, this list goes on. And I'm happy to comment uh, on any specifics here if uh, council has any questions. Um, I'll start with a question, Ms. Johnson. So the history of why we partner with the county on arts is it, does it go back 100 years like the libraries, or it was, a, it was at economies of scale? Is there, is there a story to tell? Madam Mayor, uh, and, and Paul may have some comments along these lines, but it goes back about 40 years, uh, I would say, and our bylaws are about 35 years old. Uh, reading through them, they, we, we really need to make adjustments to them because they're not applying very well to what we, we're currently doing. Uh, so we really need to take a full step back and look at what are our needs and how is everyone's time best used at this point. And the three committees are the uh, Arts and Culture Commission, 
the culture the arts and festival committee we have an events and festivals committee okay an arts advisory committee that's meeting monthly and the visual art in public places subcommittee that was meeting regularly but uh, they weren't appointed uh, correctly in in relation to uh, our resolution so we've actually because there was so much duplication of effort we have disbanded that group for for now because the review of public art, we only need so many committees to be reviewing that. So this is why the restructure is really needed. Okay, very good. And um, the city recently partnered with Women's Economic Ventures and Impact Hub and had, it was an all morning workshop looking at um, retail spaces downtown. And I know you're working on a report on that and I think our next focus is going to be talking to the commercial property owners. Um, so I, I watched the finance committee, uh, not all of it, but your discussion earlier today. And so Ms. Johnson and I are getting ready to report what, um, what's been happening in the city administrator's office related to business development, business recovery. Um, Ms. Snedden, question from you? Thank you. Is this questions and comments or just questions? I, I oh, can do yeah, this. go ahead. Okay. Questions and comments. Um, I guess for questions that on D16, um, just two of the points there that implement plans to improve vibrancy downtown and engage with stakeholders in revitalization, and then also assist downtown Santa Barbara in their efforts to reconfigure downtown business improvement district boundaries. I just, what, um, what is the mechanism for those plans or engaging and where are we in that process and do we have a framework for that or is that part of the art strategic plan or I, I see them as very worthwhile goals and I'm wondering the, how that gets done. Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Snedden, so currently I'm going to address the improvement district uh, portion of it. We currently have two business improvement districts downtown for the old town area and downtown. And each year we've been renewing uh, the assessments for uh, the downtown businesses. And that's paying for marketing and promotion services. So each year uh, those, uh, we renew it through council. Uh, basically the businesses are assessed uh, and the city passes those funds through to the downtown organization, downtown Santa Barbara. Uh, so any changes there uh, are, won't be handled in the cultural arts master plan. That group has also been looking at the, the past few years at forming the possible uh, property, uh, property and business improvement district. So they've been looking at maybe assessing an assessment for the property owners instead of just the business owners to provide additional services, enhanced services for clean and safe activities. So that's something that they are heading up, but we are providing, working with them very closely because it will be through a city funding mechanism, a city, an assessment that they need to have support for, uh, but work with us to do it in compliance with state law. The, the city sense. collects the assessments. They're it's collected awesome. by the finance department and then given back to the downtown organization or downtown Santa Barbara. That's correct. Okay, so that's in process now yes um, that is in process it's being discussed so we have regular meetings to talk about uh, their interests the services they'd like to provide the different mechanisms to move up, go about that whether it's expanding the current improvement districts or creating a new property assessment district That good. Well, any sure. I don't see any other lights. Go for it. Thank you. Um, I, I just had a few things that I mean, just an appreciation that the key sustainability dashboard I think is such a great idea, and I'm looking forward to that. And I think it's a great way to interface with the community and um, letting everybody know what it is that we're doing and working on and prioritizing. I really appreciate that weekly newsletter. Um, I share it widely. I think it really highlights key things we're doing and I always learn something that I didn't know we were doing so I really truly appreciate that um, I think let's see as a I support restructuring the arts fund so it can be more efficient and I, I love the public art and I'm glad we brought the sculptures back and that was a really fun first Thursday and would like to keep that going and bringing people downtown 
Um, and then just maybe, I, I don't know if we discuss it now or at what point, but um, you know, the having art in the open window fronts and um, I think I spoke with Sarah and she mentioned maybe having it three dimensional, interactive, or even providing screens and to put up in the windows and um, just whatever we can do to support that and, and encourage businesses that you just maybe can't keep it open for beyond 60 days with nothing in the window. Um, and that might be a really fun way to bring people downtown. So I would support that and whatever. I don't know at what point that's being discussed or not, but I think it'd be a really fantastic idea to have that be something to come and see in the open storefronts instead of um, kind of shying away from. And um, just thank you for the work that you do. Councilmember Dominguez. Before, before I start, I noticed Eric Davis was here from City TV, and I'm guessing he had to leave, but he's the new executive director, so it's glad to see him here. The, uh, the restructuring sounds like a good idea. I'm glad you guys are doing that. Do, we, do these numbers include grant funds? This is slide 19, or is that just city either general fund or enterprise funds? I'm wondering if we're getting matched or outside contributions that leverage those expenditures. Uh, on this slide, uh, this is all general fund. So are we spending money to support the arts that comes from grants? Like does Sarah York Rubin get grant money from the state or federal or private foundations that then, so for, for example, I was thinking about the, uh, the street art, the visual art in public places. Is that coming out of the county office of arts and, and culture staff when they actually install those? Where's are those funds coming from? Do we know? Yes, um, those funds are uh, that we definitely and Sarah definitely works with various organizations to lever leverage outside funding uh, funds from Santa Barbara Beautiful, for example, on the State Street sculptures. Uh, the funding on this chart for the State Street sculptures is coming from the top line item. Uh, so there's staff costs and there's some special project costs in there that we're giving to the county. Um, but she and uh, for our various projects here, everyone is leveraging outside funding uh, just beyond this amount. So different community organizations, downtown organization, uh, uh, Santa Barbara Beautiful, they contribute a lot also for the, these projects. And are most of these organizations and funds uh, central business district earmarked? Or I know some grants have been given out to organizations that have done work on Milpas, but is, are these organizations, I know there was some art at the waterfront, some beautiful art. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, uh, many of them are, not all. So I, I don't have the exact breakdown of the grants to the arts organizations, but many of them, many of those events do bring people to our commercial areas and or let's say they're in, in con concert with the performing arts centers or other organizations downtown. But we could do a, a closer examination of it. Okay. They, they are different commercial areas though, and Milpas uh, and, and now Coast Village Road. Great, thank you. Very good. Um, I don't see any other lights, Ms. Johnson. So that's your section of the presentation. And Madam Mayor. Mr. Casey. We're gonna cover measure C. If you don't mind taking a one to two minute stretch break so we can load the PowerPoint, that would Very be appreciated. Good. We're in recess.
We'll call our meeting back to order. It's June 4th, 2018. Mr. Casey, you're gonna focus on Measure C? Yes, good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I thought I would give the initial Measure C uh, presentation for a planning budget for fiscal year 19. So I'll go through the presentation. I'll have staff from all the different components that are being funded to answer any detailed questions you may have on that. Mm -hmm. And just by way of preface, so this is our first full fiscal year of planning for Measure C revenues. I want to provide it in conjunction with the general fund capital budget as well, so you can kind of see your combined capital uh, budgets together and then also let you know that as part of next year's budget we will be preparing a longer term capital improvement plan I believe it's a six year capital improvement plan and that will also include a six year outlook of measure Z at that point at the end of the presentation you'll see that I already do though identify kind of some big ticket items that we need to consider as we go forward so uh, general fund capital program including measure C capital the council placed the sales tax measure on the November 7, 2017 ballot, and uh, I want to thank again the community for passing Measure C with 56% approval. Uh, went into effect April 1st uh, via the State Board of Equalization. It is a 1% transaction in use tax estimated to generate $22 million annually. All funds are to be used locally, and it was passed as a general tax, so it's not restricted, but uh, Council's priority setting has been to use it for infrastructure needs. In February, we came to you all to adopt a resolution to determine for the first five fiscal years the priority in use of Measure C funds. And here, not in priority order, are the uh, projected uses of the funds. So uh, new police station facility, you'll have a presentation tomorrow uh, on an update on that project. Repairing local streets throughout the city, including related street infrastructure. Replacing fire station number seven up by uh, Sheffield Reservoir. Community projects to support parks and libraries. Uh, council added a business district infrastructure project and also maintenance of city uh, buildings. And again, these were not in priority order. Just real brief and a little more detail of each of those broad categories. Street infrastructure, uh, significant new investments needed to prevent serious decline. Uh, you already approved $5 million to street paving in this current fiscal year. As I mentioned, the sales tax went into effect April 1st, so we got the last quarter coming up. And so we essentially kind of front loaded that and got some improvements and you're already seeing those improvements uh, out in the street. Related streets infrastructure includes items like traffic signals, sidewalks, access ramps, street lights, storm drains, curbs and gutters. We presented a lot of this information in preparation of Measure C about how underfunded uh, a lot of these categories were and so we're able to fund them now. Current police station, uh, the planning, permitting, and bonding for a police station is getting going. Uh, it was originally built in 1959 for a population that was only 58,000. We're now over 90,000. Only had a staff of 97. We now have a staff of 225. I could go on, but I think we've made the point that the existing police station is inadequate, seismically deficient, and in need of replacement. And so we are thrilled to have the resources now to move forward with that. Let me go back though and say tomorrow you'll get more of a conversation, but we're prepared to uh, recommend you the hiring of an architect team to move the project forward. And the first critical component will be doing a needs assessment to understand the space needs and the size that the facility needs to be, but also more importantly, a site selection. And so you appointed a council subcommittee to work with the architect team and staff on site selection. And so we're prepared to begin that process with you all. It will be a challenge. We've done this before and we're unable to find an alternate site when we had redevelopment money going to this project and so decided we needed to rebuild on the existing site which is shown on the screen. The existing site is narrow and undersized and not optimum for building a police station. It is a very good location for a police station. The police like being there next to the courts, next to the district attorney, close to city hall, close to downtown. Uh, but it required quite a bit of subterranean parking and then building an essential facility on top of that, which requires the highest seismic level of construction uh, in the state. And then the relocation cost of moving the police department somewhere for two years while you build on site is extremely complicated and extremely expensive. 
So we're very motivated to find an alternate location so you don't have those added expenses and maybe it has a little more room to work with. I just want to caution that we've tried before and have come up short. So it's not going to be an easy find to find a different location that works. But we'll look. We'll look at uh, city parking lots, city commuter lots, other city assets uh, and brainstorm uh, with the architect team with you all and, and get ideas from the community. I don't know about you, but I walk around town and people are always coming up. Have you thought about uh, questions for the police department? And that's great. Fire Station 7 and other fire station improvements are really needed. Uh, this is Fire Station 7, like I set up at uh, Sheffield Reservoir. You've already funded the design work, preliminary design work. We're looking at this corner, the existing corner site, and also the Sheffield Reservoir building corner. So just up the block is another option. Similar issue about not building on the same site, so you don't have relocation issues. Uh, each site could be good, though, and so we'll kind of keep playing that out. Maintenance of city facilities is certainly very important priority, and so that is funding the capital reinvestment into our facilities, and so that is good. We have talked for a number of years how we haven't been investing enough into roof replacements, HVAC replacements, those types of improvements. Park and recreation facilities, clearly a very important need. They are our largest department uh, from a facility standpoint. They own a number, dozens of buildings throughout the community. Uh, wonderful buildings, wonderful assets, uh, all built quite some time ago and reaching their age of life. Uh, none more important than the Cabrillo Pavilion shown here. Uh, and we will talk to you about a financing approach to paying for the construction on that. Library improvements, I will ad lib a little bit as we get to the slide later because about two hours ago, the Finance Committee asked us to prioritize $500,000 for the Library Plaza and asked staff to brainstorm some options about where from other capital projects to take that $500,000 from, which we'll bring back to you Wednesday night. Uh, but the Library Plaza has been an in interest of the cities for some time. It was funded by the redevelopment agency until the redevelopment agency got uh, dismantled. Uh, but design work had been completed under that, so we do have an approved design. Uh, the $500,000 would pay for finishing the final design and getting permits ready. And the Library Foundation has been at Council and Finance Committee expressing their interest to try to fundraise the construction cost. We don't know exactly how much it'll cost. That's one thing we'd like to do through final design. About five to seven years ago, it was in the $3 million range. So uh, that gives you, I think, a, a general rule of thumb of what you're talking about. But I want to caution not to get stuck on that number until we do final design. Mr. Casey, um, can I interrupt you of to course. ask? So we're, we're looking at hurrying to find $500,000, but the Library Plaza is occupied right now as a construction zone for the Museum of Art. How would that timing uh, work? Those are good questions and things that need to be worked out. So we have an agreement, a license agreement with the museum to use the Library Plaza for construction staging, but that expires in August of this year. Uh, we expect shortly to be getting an interest from the museum or not uh, to extend that uh, license agreement. I have committed to you all as part of the library department's budget that I'll bring that decision point back to you about if, when, and for how long do you want to continue an arrangement with the museum to use it as staging. If you fund $500,000 to do final design and then uh, hope for a community fundraising campaign, you're at least a year out before starting construction. So you've got some time to think about how you want to deal with the construction staging that's occurring on site. Do we have a sense how much more time the museum wants? When we met with the museum, uh, Madam Mayor, Oh, a couple months or so ago, they've got a still a multi-phased approach to improving that site. So I think in a perfect world, they would want it for a number of years. Uh, I think two, three. A maybe number even. of years? Yes. In, in a perfect world, just from their uh, self-interest. So I think that you will hear that. But I think we've also been telling them that there's a new interest in finishing the library plaza and that might not be possible. And I think they realize that. So it's part of the dialogue and conversation we'll need to have with them. Thank you. So then we go to the spreadsheets. And I apologize, the handouts, they're, they're hard to read, so I hope you can see up on the board. And I'll walk you through them a little bit. Uh, it's one reason I'm sitting down here, so I can see it on the big screen. 
so I'm going to show you two things just real quick. I'm going to show you a general fund capital program and a measure C capital program together. So I'm going to toggle back and forth. So let's start with the measure C capital program. This is staff's initial recommendation. Finance committee supported this recommendation with the uh, addition, though, of trying to find $500,000 for the library plaza. Uh, so the police department, you can see we're budgeting $2 million for fiscal year 19. That will assist with the architecture, uh, the planning, the site selection, and initial environmental review and other costs that go into a, a facility of the scope and magnitude of a police station. Uh, you'll see the majority of the money or a good chunk of the money will go into pavement and street infrastructure. So we've got uh, over $12.5 million into pavement, and then on top of that, money for access ramps, storm drains, traffic signals, street lights, and sidewalks. So all rolled up together, uh, you're getting close to $16 million for pavement and street infrastructure there. Uh, fire station alerting system, uh, this is really needed within the fire departments, and so we're recommending funding that out of Measure C. Parks and Recreation, uh, you'll see initially, just for next year, a small amount, $128,000. When we awarded the contract late last year to start Cabrillo Pavilion, we knew we were $5 million short uh, for the cost of doing the project, plus needing $4 million from the community fundraising campaign. You can see if we did all $5 million in FY19, it would really take away our ability to get a good head start on the streets infrastructure and facility maintenance things. So we're, we're recommending a loan from the general fund for five years that you would pay back a million dollars a year out of Measure C funds just to kind of feather in that cost to allow you to hit some other kind of key priorities right up off the bat. So. That's our staff's recommendation. You could turn around and say, no, we want to pay the whole five million up front right now in FY19, and we could do it that way. Out of the general fund operating reserve? Correct, yep. So that's our staff recommendation. I think finance committee was okay with that approach. Uh, Thanks. And then Louise Lowry Davis Center Renovation for $871,000. We've done all the design work. That project is ready to go. Ms. Zachary can talk about that more if you like. That is one of the sites that we're going to be looking at for a possible police station. And so at Finance Committee, we talked about, is this a project that maybe we put off a fiscal year to find the $500,000 for Library Plaza, see how the police station site selection goes, and whether Louise Lowry Davis ends up being where you want to build a police station, at which point I think improvements to Louise Lowry would be incorporated into design work as part of that. So that's one of the things we'll talk as staff over the next couple days when we come back to you Wednesday night if, if we think that's uh, something to think about or not. Business corridor improvements. This was what council asked that we do as a priority is to set aside each year um, some money to kind of help with uh, different business corridors across uh, the city. Flexible as to how you want to use it. Uh, an initial use for us is to kind of get at the bricks on downtown. If you notice, uh, they're starting to get a little worn and bumpy in some areas, and so kind of having a little strategic plan to get at uh, pulling up those bricks, reflattening out underneath, and putting the bricks back in. That's the one advantage of the bricks is they're kind of easy to work with in that regard, but it's time when you walk around and look at it. Uh, we need to hit some areas on that. And then facilities maintenance, just highlighting fire station three, fire station four, fire station five, doing minor renewals and reinvestment of those stations. Uh, the Los Banos boiler replacement needs to happen and East Side Library improvements. So that's a $22 million uh, capital program of Measure C. And again, I want that to be coupled with, in your mind, the general fund capital program. So in addition to that, we've got uh, our traditional ADA transition plans, walkways, buildings, pathways uh, that we fund every year just to try to continue to improve our facilities from an ADA uh, and physical plant standpoint. Uh, staff is recommending finishing off the city wayfinding sign program. We implemented the first half of that, and we think it'd be good. Uh, they've been very well received, and they look so much better than the existing sign, so it'd be nice to finish that up. $80,000, uh, just a kind of minor grant opportunities for the neighborhood park and facility improvement program. Off-leash dog area at McKenzie Park for $135,000. Um, thousand steps. Uh, I believe we got grant money. We also, from the oil spill, uh, got money for thousand steps. So I think that's why we're deleting that hundred thousand dollars. 
or take a park renovation. Ms. Zachary can talk more about that, but that's kind of an initial small phase that might come out of the planning process there. The West Beach Aquatic Facility, you recently approved the design grant uh, to get that rebuilt. And then Franceschi Park renovation has also been something council's directed us to kind of keep plugging away at. Central Library uh, security cameras, uh, really kind of needed from a safety, both from a staffing standpoint, but also from a customer standpoint. And then a really needed improvement to the library staff workspace down on the bottom level. Uh, as you go out the back, if you've ever kind of snuck out the back door towards the museum, it's where all the staff works in the library and the book sorting goes, and it's really not a hospitable place to work. And so uh, we've already done the design work and ready to do the renovation there. And then we've talked about this with you all as well, uh, funding the capital needs to get the downtown visitor center bathroom into the uh, visitor facility at the Hotel Californian. And so we've got the agreement coming and ready to go for that. And so this is the capital cost in that regard. So that gives you a recommended just shy of $2 million general fund capital program. Then out years, just to kind of get your head around the scope and the uh, not unfortunate, but the challenge of we've got a lot of needs we'd like to get to and we'd like to get them all now and there's not quite enough money to, to bite off uh, everything we want to do. So we're going to have to make some decisions as we go forward. And so this isn't a day to figure that out, but this is what will go into the multi-year capital improvement planning that will need guidance from you as we go along. We want to maintain a robust pavement program. Uh, as a commitment to Measure C. And so you can see staying at the $12 million range through 2020 and then in the $10 million range going forward. The police station, $2 million each year to get through the design. That's just an estimate at this point. Uh, that might change upwards or downwards as we're actually going through it. And then you can see in year six, uh, that $7.5 million for the police station way over on the far right is uh, starting to pay for debt financing for a police station. And so that's when a big number comes in to start paying debt service on a police station and you'll see you're then gonna have to calibrate down the rest of your measure C program going forward. But each year, keeping at the access ramps, the storm drains, the traffic signals, the street lights, um, a few little money in there for the bridges that we continue to get federal grant money for, which is a wonderful uh, use of getting additional resources into the community. Um, some funds to do some upgrades to the Laguna pump station, which has been long time coming and needed to help with uh, flooding during rainy events, which will occur again. That's my hopeful thinking on that, right? Good, steady, moderate rain will occur again. Uh, Fire Station 7, you can see that uh, multi-year funding there. Cabrillo Pavilion, you'll see the million dollars a year starting in fiscal year 2020, kind of paying off that. Um, Thousand Steps, West Beach Splash playground dwight murphy field kicks in possibly if we have the money again you'll look at the bottom and there's a lot of red so we're gonna have to make choices about what gets funded or not uh, central library ada elevator is a real important project and something that i feel committed to seeing through uh, to get ada access to all levels at an adequate level uh, when we implemented the children's library on the bottom level uh, we kind of agreed to give us a couple years to bring in the uh, ADA accessible elevator to access that level. And so I feel uh, an obligation to finish that. Central Library Plaza, that was just a plug number of $3 million, and we've talked a little bit about that. And then facilities maintenance and business corridor improvements. So you can see we're short anywhere from 5 to $8 million in fiscal years 20 and 21 of that kind of too big for our eyes wish list. Um, again, can't stress enough how thankful to have Measure C. Uh, we would be in such a world of hurt from a street standpoint and the other facility standpoint. Uh, but as we said throughout the Measure C uh, discussion, our needs are greater than what Measure C is coming and that's just kind of illustrating that and that's okay. It just means we're gonna have to make priorities as we go on. So that covers uh, the presentation, like I said. Key Stafford are here to answer any questions you might have. Oh, and let me just recap again. The Finance Committee uh, did two actions. Um, yes, they took two actions. And remind me if I'm wrong, Chair Hart. Uh, one is uh, try to find 500000 for starting the final design for Library Plaza. 
and look for ways to fund that and bring some recommendations back Wednesday evening. And then add street tree planting to the pavement efforts. Uh, Ms. Zachary gave a very brief presentation. It's about $95,000 a year. And so that would come out of the, uh, uh, the pavement uh, and street infrastructure. Staff will just find out where we come up with that, but that would then plant trees as part of the uh, areas that we're hitting with the street pavement stuff. I think those are the two actions that happened there. Um, uh, Mr. Hart and then Mr. Rouse. So w we didn't have the slide 17 at the finance committee, or excuse me, 18, the next one. This yeah, one. correct. Yes. You did not have the long term. We at the finance committee, you did not today, but at the prior finance prior committee, one, yes. you did. So um, Ortega Park, $1 million, $3 million and $7 million. So that's $11 million. Ms. Zachary. Mayor uh, Murillo and Council Member Hart, again, those are numbers that we've put in assuming, for example, that we would be putting in artificial sports turf and that we would be refurbishing the pool facility there. The master plan process will define really ultimately what that happens but we wanted to make sure we could capture the potential full cost we should have a much better idea by the end of this calendar year um, as to what the community really wants to see happen there and what our options are for the types of improvements and the benefits um, of those improvements so we were going from what we thought might happen and then the phasing again is related to you wouldn't have to do it all in one year. Often when we put together a capital program, and this came out of our last six-year plan, which we um, brought to council a year and a half ago now, is kind of assuming that those things would move, would be what moved forward. Okay, well, and, it, and also, if I could add, um, Council Member Hart, um, there's other aspects of moving some of these projects forward that aren't necessarily reflected right now because as you know we have um, a foundation that's very interested in funding improvements at Dwight Murphy Field and then we also have potential opportunities once we have the entitlements for our projects we have the design work done and the approvals to secure other sources of funds other than Measure C for example. It's just a lot of money and it's you know it's more than we talked about at the Finance Committee by a large margin and, um, you know, I think there just has to be some, some dis hard decisions made about, you know, spending money on design for things that are not affordable. You know, I don't, I don't understand that. So we'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Uh, don't go away. Cause I'll have questions for you, Ms. Zachary, but Mr. Rouse. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Casey, going back to uh, station seven. At one point in time, was there some talk of a cooperative uh, design effort with Forest Service on that on that station? Yeah, Madam Mayor and Councilmember Rouse. Yes, and there still is conversation. Uh, not super fruitful at this point, but we're going to kind of take one more stab at it. But at some point, if the federal government doesn't seem like they're going to come <clears> along, <throat> I think we need to move forward with Station 7 without them. But yes, we are having conversations. We would like to uh, do some sort of joint co-located facility there with their involvement, but we'll see if they have an ability to pay us one way or the other. And my second question, because you, you did kind of throw it in the mix, was were we to throw Louise Lowry, that property, into the conversation about a police station potentially, would that end up having to go to the, the public for a vote prior to making any kind of action? Madam Mayor and Council Member Rouse, yes. Uh, a good portion of that Louise Lowry property that we think of, of being the Police Activities League at Chapala, the parking lot, the Louise Lowry Davis Center, and then the lawn bowling, uh, I think at least two thirds of that is zoned parks and recreation. That would need a vote of the people to be used for something other than parks facilities. So that's one of the complicating factors of looking at that site for a police station. Thank you. I had a question about that too. Um, uh, people think of the Louise Lowry Davis Center as our senior citizen center. And if we, would we be able to move that function somewhere 
Yeah. We're all getting older, right, Mr. Casey? We no. need our senior center. No, no, no. We're not all getting older. Uh, Madam Mayor, that is one of the design uh, questions we'll have to look at and think about. Do If it becomes that that's a nice place for a police station for any number of reasons, are you factoring in a community center within that new proposal or are you relocating them to a different part of town? I think everything's on the table with regards to how that, that could work. Um, you know, conceptually, I can see building something on that campus that still is a community facility it might be a really nice co-location opportunity. But again, until you get the architect team to kind of lay it all out, to see where the parking goes, to see where the police station goes, how it all factors in, um, everything's on the table, I think. Okay. And then my other smaller question for the parks director, the Los Baños boilers. I thought we... <laughs> I thought we um, upgraded those in recent memory, or maybe I'm not remembering correctly, ma'am. Madam Mayor and Council Members, I actually would defer to the facilities manager um, on that question. Mr. Wilson. don't mind. Thanks. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council. Yeah, the existing boilers were replaced roughly four or five years ago, I believe, a little, little more than five years ago. Uh, um, <clears throat> those boilers were extremely efficient boilers, so we we're kind of prioritizing energy savings. And over the course of time, they've kind of become a bit of a maintenance issue. So it wasn't, uh, um, the, the boilers themselves weren't compatible with the pool's chlorine and chemical makeup over time. Mm -hmm. So we've just kind of found that they've been a real issue. So based on the amount of maintenance that we're putting into those and the, the risk of them going down and resulting in an emergency replacement, it's just kind of a, a, a critical piece that needs to be done. And we're going to look towards something that's a little more maintenance friendly, but possibly have to taper off on the energy efficiency of them. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Ms. Snedden, go ahead. Just a small comment. I wouldn't have brought this up actually, except for that you mentioned the bricks on State Street and then becoming uneven. And um, they were put in in the 80s, yeah, early 90s. And um, just anecdotally, I had a dear friend, many people, anybody listening would remember Ted Townsend in a wheelchair. And even with an electronic wheelchair, he was, after the bricks were put in, unable to ride on State Street anymore. So even though we had the gutters that let people off in the corners and to cross, it was, you know, it, it became inaccessible um, to some people in wheelchairs. And I just... Um, and then when we're talking about State Street and what we might be doing with State Street, I'm just uh, wondering at what point, my question is about the process, at what point would we discuss the sidewalks on State Street and maybe, I mean, uh, different ideas have come out about that being patio, more patio spaces for restaurants or, I don't know, having planters or different spaces out. So just where in the process would we start to talk about that? Or at, at all, Madam Mayor. A couple cu couple questions in there. First, it was kind of the mid late '90s that the brick sidewalks went in. The redevelopment agency did a major overhaul of the streetscape and landscaping program. Did not include brick sidewalks, and the property owners stepped up and assessed themselves to upgrade to uh, the brick sidewalks, and they covered that delta cost. Uh, it was beautiful when it went in. It, you know, State Street was the the jewel of the country uh, with the way it looked. Um, it needs repair. Uh, your second part of the question is, do we want to take a comprehensive look and do a major overhaul? That I think would be up to council. That's not currently on staff's radar to do. It's not on direction. It, it, we're looking more at proper maintenance and uh, getting them improved. But um, if council wanted to prioritize a complete makeover, it's not cheap, but it's something that we could do if that's of interest. And I'm not suggesting we do that right now. I just wanted to m maybe put that out there that before we did that major project that we maybe revisit it if that's the way we wanted to redo it when the time comes later. Thanks. Any other questions on the Measure C presentation and priorities, Mr. Dominguez? So at the Finance Committee, we had a slide, and I don't know if it would be useful to show the members who weren't at the Finance Committee the slide 8, which has the 1.145 additional items to be considered, <clears throat> just in terms of how the interplay is between some of the things we're asking for. I think they'll have to find the, the other presentation. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. 
Madam Mayor, Council Members, Bob Samario. So that $1.1 million that was discussed with Finance Committee represented um, some of the additional funding re items that were considered by the Finance Committee, um, city attorney's positions, the funding for Visit Santa Barbara's request and things like that. So that'll be coming back to the Council on Wednesday with the Finance Committee's recommendations about how, which ones we would, um, the committee wanted to have funded and how we would go about funding those. Thank you. And the Finance Committee meeting was videotaped, and so those of us who weren't there can... I watched a little bit of it in my office, but... Yeah, if, I'll, I'll, if now's an appropriate time for you all, I can kind of recap where we are in the budget process and kind of the key decision points that you I don't see left. any other lights on, okay. so go ahead. And that's part of what Mr. Dominguez was saying. And, and Bob, I don't know, can we pull up the PowerPoint? We might as well show you to have you all have your head in the game. Uh, so we're down to it. Uh, we've got one more meeting Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Uh, we're hoping that we'll get final direction from you all. We will add in the city attorney's presentation at the beginning of that since we missed that today. Uh, they took it off. Um, is it there? But while he's pulling that up, Mr. Casey, yes. what we're missing from our city attorney being ill today is that what he wants more money for, you're going to tell us, is yes. implementing our planning. Okay. So here is kind of the key slide that you will see on Wednesday night that you're going to have to think through. And I'll just briefly walk through because we've got some time if that's all right. The city attorney is recommending about $280,000 to bring in another deputy city attorney and legal secretary to do a couple things. One, to increase our ability to do uh, enforcement. Uh, code enforcement and other types of enforcement, which seems to be a priority. At the same time, freeing up a couple staff to work on those long-term planning issues, especially housing related, that we've got the planning staff able to do, but we really need the attorney staff to do so as well. So this is in response to a couple of uh, council priorities of, you know, hey, if we wanna do more, how can we do it? Uh, it just comes with a decent price tag, and so we have to figure that out. Uh, already talked about Library Plaza. And so that will be, we'll bring back some thoughts on a capital option there. Uh, Finance Committee, by a two to one vote, uh, recommends that council consider a full time public education coordinator in the fire department to address bilingual uh, needs. And so uh, that will be up for full council consideration. Uh, we are hopeful that tomorrow the county will solve that impacts of the county board action, uh, the $191,000. We hope that comes off. We talked at the Finance Committee about uh, this gap in our projected revenues next year due to the reduced uh, sales and bed tax from the Thomas Fire and Debris Flow. We're calculating that about $370,000, and maybe I'll let Mr. Samario explain uh, how we're going to address that next fiscal year. Madam Mayor, Council Members, so uh, just a few weeks a week ago, I asked our staff, our Treasury staff, to give me an estimate of what the Latest numbers are for next year in terms of bed tax and sales tax. We just got a number for bed tax, you know, last month where it was down 9%. And we had made some adjustments to our projections this year, but minimal impacts next year. And it's becoming more evident that um, these impacts are going to be ongoing to some extent next year. We know that this year we're going to be coming in about $375,000 below our, even our revised projections that, that lower the base for next year. So we thought rather than sort of go with numbers that we don't think are realistic, let's lower those estimates for next year for sales tax, which is about $150,000, the balance being for bed tax. And, and with that, where that would come from is, since we already balanced, it would come from reserves. It would come from our reserve for economic contingency. Um, back in February, when we, we saw these, these sort of these impacts and expected some of this impact, we mentioned to the Finance Committee, I think even Council, that if there, there was an impact into next year, that we probably would be looking to come out of reserves for that. That's what the reserves are for, the economic, economic contingency reserves and disaster reserves. Mm -hmm. So we thought rather than trying to respond so quickly to make cuts into the organization, let's just go ahead and take it out of reserves next year, recognizing that in, this, in FY20, we're gonna have to resolve that. But there'll be a lot of other moving parts and as we put together FY20. Um, so, um, but that's sort of our proposal. We just brought to this to the Finance Committee for the first time uh, this afternoon. And then the next item, the Finance Committee did not recommend bringing that forward, and that's the um, idea of a potential downtown strategic plan. So uh, we won't be presenting that to you Wednesday night. 
but we will be presenting you the request from Visit Santa Barbara. They're requesting $150,000. The Finance Committee, I believe the final recommendation was for $100,000, challenging them to find the other $50,000 from the other partners and funding that $100,000 at a minimum half waterfront fund, half general fund, uh, maybe consider downtown parking in that mix or not. Um, and so we'll bring back a recommendation on that. So those are kind of the key decision points. As we tipped our hat to the finance committee, or tipped our hand, that's the better term, um, Mr. Smarion, and I think that we can bring you a package to fund uh, your interest that is up there. Uh, we're funding some ongoing items with one-time fund just to kind of get us through the second year of the two-year financial plan, so then we'll have to kind of recalibrate as part of the next budget cycle. And so do we think there's a way forward that you can fund most what's up there? Yes. Uh, does it make us a little nervous because both Bob and I are conservative with regards to the budget and worried about kind of the prospects going forward of everything kind of trending in a negative way, but you never know. It does make us a little worried, but we think we can get there. And we also think that, you know, you've got real important policy needs and policy issues you want to get to. And so we respect that as well. Um, so you're conservative in not projecting a whole lot of revenue coming from cannabis, uh, commercial cannabis, Mr. Casey? Madam Mayor, that's a very good question. Uh, we have not budgeted any cannabis revenue for fiscal year 19. We do have the two medical storefronts coming online. Uh, it's looking like they will be coming online within the next month or so. Uh, so there is some revenue there. Our initial analysis is in the range of $100,000 maybe, $150,000 maybe. So that's one of the things we might put out to you Wednesday night is to kind of book that revenue. Uh, we are in the process of going through the storefront dispensaries and the other of selecting those. Um, I think realistically it takes at least nine months for them to go through the permitting and construction before they're open, so are they open for the last quarter of fiscal year 19? Maybe. Do we want to book revenue on that when it might take them a year before they get open? That's why we haven't uh, kind of booked that revenue. But that is an upside potential. Uh, just I'll, two upside potentials I see. Uh, one is cannabis revenue. I think definitely in FY20 we'll have a much better idea and we'll be planning for that. FY19 seems a little yeah. sketchy, but maybe the $150,000 from the two. The other just kind of pie in the sky one is if the Supreme Court rules on the South Dakota case about taxing internet sales in the favor of local jurisdictions and states, it's possible that could get implemented in January. Uh, and that would be a boon to us. Um, but we haven't heard the Supreme Court ruling, and we also don't know what the implementation phase will be to kind of unravel that. So we haven't uh, done those revenues. And just on the caution side, you know, our PERS costs continue to go up, and so that's just a headwind. Sales tax and bed tax are just struggling. We're concerned about meeting the, the budgeted numbers that we've thrown out for those already. Property tax has been good. Um, so you just kind of factor that all in, and we, we kind of, feel we're in balance and we can maybe get to these things, but it'll be tight. Um, I don't see any lights, so I'll keep talking. Um, uh, I had a couple of thoughts about the Visit Santa Barbara request. One was to uh, give them the 150000 now, but deduct it from next year's uh, payment to them. Um, the other one is I hear Mr. Samario talking about our reserves are for rainy days, they are for emergencies, and certainly I think the impetus for this request is that we lost a lot of visitors um, during those terrible months of uh, fire and, and debris flow uh, impact. You know, I, I, I'm wondering if I could make the same argument for the public education coordinator in, um, uh, uh, for our Spanish-speaking community. I mean, it's not if we're preparing people for an emergency, and I'm paranoid about earthquake all the time, uh, not to bring one on, but um, so I, I do hear that there's money already in the budget for a half-time uh, Spanish um, speaking, uh, or someone who can, can help us with that outreach. Is that right, Mr. Casey? Yeah, and, and Madam Mayor and Council Members, I'll answer the question, I just want to temper, we didn't, uh, agendize for a full conversation on this, so I don't really want you all oh, to start okay. giving me direct. No, I don't mind the question. I just don't want the rest of you to kind of respond and start 
forming your opinions. We'll do this all on Wednesday night. Um, but I will say, I, I think the use of reserves for the Visit Santa Barbara one-time request is something that we're going to look at as part of our recommendation, because I do think that's why you have reserves. It's why you have disaster reserves. And I think clearly we had a disaster there. Uh, I wouldn't be as encouraging about looking at using reserves for funding the ongoing cost of the public education coordinator position. Um, okay. re reserves should be used for one-time cost. Operating costs, we got to build into our operating budget. Understood. Okay. And I don't see any other lights. Um, Good. So 6 p.m. Wednesday, uh, and just for the new council members, this is kind of the final direction, hopefully. Uh, then we go off for two weeks and kind of bundle it all together and bring it back for you for adoption because we are required to adopt a budget by the end of June. And we have a council meeting tomorrow, so don't forget that. Oh, thanks. If there's nothing else, I'll close the meeting. <laughs>